know, I spoke with many Kabbalists. They are living in another world. They gave me some drugs, I don't know even what. <laughs> I didn't feel anything. In the afternoon, I'm going to TV and I'm declaring myself a Messiah. So why assume that there was ever some form of uh, Judaism that was totally divorced of Mephibosheth? Maybe we'll begin very briefly, just discussing some of your upraising, just very briefly, coming from Romania to Israel, yeah. and then your rise in the scholarship, some of the themes in your, your major works, and then I have a few core, core subjects that I've chosen that I'd like to get to. How does that sound as far as structure goes? Right. Sounds all right? Look, uh, I made Aliyah. When I was allowed to make Aliyah with the family, meaning uh, we wanted to leave much earlier, but the communists didn't allow. And then I arrived, I had to, to study Hebrew and English and matriculation and, and then to go to the army and meaning a uh, normal, almost a normal Israeli trajectory. Right. right. You say it's almost normal, but I know that in the army, just kind of for fun, you were studying Japanese. Is that true? Yes, it was <laughs> part of the protest against, uh, you know, the hardship of of uh, of the training period right I mean, yes but while you were in the army and even earlier you were already reading on the scholarship of religion and philosophy Mircheliade you mentioned as one of your no, early I, readings I, I read a lot of philosophy not on religion because in Romania we didn't have books on religion right meaning that uh, not that I had something against or not but it simply it was not available right uh, when I arrived to Israel, I used to read Eliade, but I read Eliade much more in order to improve my English <laughs> rather than to, <laughs> to study religion. So, but it was fascinating to read him. Yes. Uh, for sure, it was not uh, a critical reading, it was just consuming what he said. Right. Which was very attractive. Right. And slowly, after many, many years, I became disillusioned with his views. Yes. I, mean, I wrote a whole book. On, on yes, this. yes, yes, yes. But this book, you know, not just to write a book. I had to invest a lot of years of, of studying material, which are unknown, in fact, in Israel or even in America. Uh, material that belonged to Eliade's, Eliade's corpus. Yes. Starting with in Romania, I never heard about him because uh, <laughs> he was persona non grata. Right, right. And this religion. So right. When I arrived to Israel, I had other things to do than to read Eliad. But in the moment, in the army, when I started to improve my English, I started to read. And uh, his uh, English is very, very available, uh, very... He writes in a very popular manner and... Then I discovered that, in fact, he was a good friend of one of my heroes in Romania. Oh, really? Who was a playwright, a Jewish playwright, which I didn't know that he was Jewish, was uh, Mikhail Sebastian. And that was fascinating for me to see this Eliade that I knew that he's Romanian, but right. uh, coming from another world. And this Mikhail Sebastian, that I was admiring his uh, place. Uh, so that was an incentive to... Then I discovered that there were rumors about his far-right views, right. which became even more interesting. <laughs> and then started the polemics about him in early 90s. Uh, I started to speak with people who were experts in Romanian affairs, and it was uh, simply fascinating yes. to discover some repressed aspects of his history, which has to do also with his scholarship. Yes, yes, certainly they're they're connected there. But you weren't you weren't even reading him because of your shed because he was a compatriot. You were just reading him simply because he was accessible and and you appreciated. Uh, the the English. Was, you know, I was living in Kvarata. In Kvarata, in, you know, in the public library, that's what I, I found. Right. 
I, I knew that he's Romanian by his name. It was obvious, right. but uh, that's that was important for me. Right. And when you, even when you finished your military service, after you'd been reading Eliade and others, from from what I've read of your previous interviews, you were considering to become a high school teacher. Is that correct? Yes, but uh, no. There was. You must remember, meaning after I finished uh, the army, it was an economical crisis. Yes. Here. So there was no job. But that's, uh, that's another story. I, mean, I kept reading in order to to learn about religion. It seems it seems almost. This is just from an outsider's perspective. It seems like you fell into the study of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism almost by mistake. I, mean, I had no idea what Kabbalah is, right. and I didn't intend to study Kabbalah. Right. It was uh, even not in a dream. I mean, I was much more interested in philosophy. Yeah. But I couldn't study philosophy because I was only Hadash. And I had to secure a job. I mean, what can I do with uh, philosophy? Right. So I studied Hebrew literature and English literature. Now, to be sure, they can be a high school teacher. So, despite the fact I was not terribly interested in either of them. And then. There was some form of economical miracle, 69-70, when Israel gave a lot of uh, scholarship for Ole, Olim Hadashim. I was not Ole Hadash, but they, uh, uh, how to put it, didn't count the years I was in the army. <laughs> So out of the blue, I received scholarship and uh, I didn't have to pay. I paid everything, including high, high school. But at a certain moment, there was uh, economical relief. So I could return to, to read philosophy and I wanted to write a page on philosophy. That was not my aspiration. It was the fact that I was enrolled at the Hebrew University first time as a PhD in philosophy. Right, and Maimonides, if I, if I remember correctly. Maimonides, I didn't know. Maimonides, Ibn Ezra, it was not clear. Right. It was not clear. I continued reading also other issues. And you're, you pivoted at some point um, from, from philosophy to Kabbalah to Jewish mysticism. Not exactly because uh, I continued to study philosophy with Professor Shlomo Pines for yes. many, many, many years later. Yes. All his seminars. I finished uh, the PhD in 76, but all, I attended all his seminars in philosophy. And we became very, very close friends. So I didn't uh, desert it. Right, right. You didn't abandon it. philosophy. And also my approach to Kabbalah is closer to those figures who are more philosophical. Correct, correct. It, to, to me, the great irony is that it seems like you almost became a scholar or you became studying and interested in Jewish mysticism almost by, by accident, like Bimikre, you would say in Hebrew. Not almost. <laughs> exactly, by, by accident. So how, can you answer this for me? How do you go from accidentally falling into the study of Kabbalah yes. to becoming what many consider to be the world's leader <laughs> in the uh, look, academically in the I didn't field. Intend to become, I had no idea that I'm going to teach in the university and I had no plans and I didn't know what I'm going to do when I finished the PhD. I was already married and we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, there was another, how to put it, phenomenon, which uh, is Jewish studies were allowed a lot of positions in at the beginning of the 70s positions in the Institute of Jewish Studies and uh, I was very interested or already interested to, to know what I didn't study Kabbalah ever right ever And I have seen a lot of manuscripts. What attracted me is the fact that there are so many unknown manuscripts. That is the most important issue is curiosity. 
So I studied manuscripts, manuscripts which had nothing to do with my PhD subject, just out of curiosity. Then there was another university, very different from today. The fact that I studied manuscripts and had discussions with Sholem, with Pines, was as if I wrote articles. No one pushed me to finish the PhD and uh, publish. There's nothing. I never heard something like that. <laughs> so I could afford to continue to read manuscripts for years. And I received scholarship to do it. Not to do it, to, I received scholarship. And I, understand, I understood that it's going to be fine, that I don't do it's not a great mistake, what I'm doing. The fact that I studied so many manuscripts it gave me another perspective rather right. than other scholars who are writing a PhD on printed books and didn't see manuscripts in right. their life or one manuscript. Right. So that's what happened. And when you're reading these manuscripts, you, you were bringing with you the theories of earlier scholars, right? No, many manuscripts were never read by anyone, including Scholem. Hmm. Because at the National Library, the Institute of Microfilms, and new material came all the time, including many manuscripts that Scholem couldn't see. With all his efforts he made, he couldn't see issues, manuscripts in Russia, for example. That added other angles than what was written on the basis of the manuscripts available in the 30s and the 40s by Scholem. And uh, I, at the beginning, I've seen that there are differences between what Scholem is writing and what I see. Right. So I, I met him and I told him, look, <laughs> there are differences. So he told me, write me a letter, I shall answer. She wrote me a letter, I wrote him a letter, he answered in a very yake, point after point after point. I didn't agree with his, uh, the PhD, when I wrote the PhD, I quoted this letter saying, look, at this date he wrote me a letter and he claimed so and so, and, and that's written the PhD. And I didn't, I was not hard. Uh, by it, on the contrary. So, I didn't want to become, I, not I didn't want, I didn't imagine to become a scholar. It was just a field very bizarre, with a lot of unknown material. Then Kabbalah was not in like today. Right. Today is another world. Then Kabbalah, no one knew what to do with Kabbalah. How did, how did Gershon Shalom respond to your criticisms of his readings? I have the letter, I mean. He wrote, Ashrei mi shemitaken atzmo, oi le mi shacheri metaknim I have it written with a date. Uh, uh, happy is someone who correct himself, woe to someone who is corrected by others. Hmm. That I can show you the letter. <laughs> and but we remain in very good relations. Otherwise, I wouldn't receive, obviously, I wouldn't receive uh, a job. Despite the fact, I kept my positions in the PhD and mentioned the fact that I disagree. Yeah. But there was no problem. I mean, I was, how to put it, uh, privileged basically to receive the job and uh, promotions and that's quite it's quite magnanimous of him that he that he opened himself up to, to criticism from a young scholar who was known at the time i cannot explain what happened um, i had many discussions with him for sure he was the figure and i didn't feel any pressure not to publish something that I defer or never. I mean, he was big enough then 
in order to be able to how to to manage also some minor to make space for you. Yes. Yeah, no, that's but very uh, he had the feeling that I'm going to criticize him more, <laughs> and uh, he told some people that it was published in Haaretz that I should write. Sh Sholem was quoted. I should write a book criticizing him. Right. Which you you ended up did you ended up doing that 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 prophecy bore true. Look, I didn't intend to do it. You know, people uh, have the mythology of you know. I didn't intend to write any book. Great. Because I didn't have to write. I was promoted without writing books. Right. So friends of mine pushed me to write. Right. It was uh, David Ruderman, Ivan Marcus. He told me, look, uh, if you have those ideas, why don't you write a book? Right. So you went out to murder the father. That wasn't your objective. Look, given the fact that I didn't feel pressure to write, for sure not books, even not articles. I wrote articles, but not because of the pressure. And no one told me, look, you need a book you know, to be promoted. I was already so not associate professor. Social professor without writing one single book. Right. And I, when I was promoted, I was promoted not because I wrote the books. Right. Uh, meaning, writing the book uh, that it is the criticism of Sholem, it's not something intended or planned or something. Simply in 86 and JTS, people encourage me yes. to write something right. more general right. for discussion. Right. So I wrote something right. and there is criticism there. It's very natural. Right. I, I hope that, uh, you know, I didn't exaggerate. Right. Mm. You, you, wrote, you wrote a work which was published in 1988, if I'm correct. Yes. New, Kabbalah, New Perspectives, yes. where you really turned over, you turned the field on its head. And, and that wasn't the end of, that was just the beginning of your scholarship. I, I don't know, to, look, just, it's not a phase. I Meaning, I continue to read manuscripts between seventy-one and eighty-six of the time, and I continue to do it after writing the book. In scholarship, especially in humanities, changes are in inevitable. Right. Meaning uh, to say, look, you did something exceptional. There's nothing exceptional. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is the way of the world. Meaning to say that. Things that Sholem wrote in the thirties should, uh, how to put it, hold for many, right. many decades. Right. It is right. unnatural. Right. So the fact that there are differences is something quite normal, right. I believe. Right. So the you, people created a mythology. Right. You, you, you're portraying it as quite normal, and I think that's humble of you because, I mean, you've gone on to be so prolific. You've wrote in over 30 major, major works, and you, it's very hard to keep up with your writing because every time you, you refresh to look at the writing list, there's a new so book that's, that's out every year. There's a new normal, book. That's no? normal, think I think it's extraordinary. It's um, normal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious what, what kind of the, what the secret sauce is in, in your working because, because you're this, the prolificness of your work, and and I think I think it's going to take many many decades, if I can be fair, to to grapple with with your output, at the very least. Look, I don't write uh, almost any book which is planned or intended. Uh, the book about my perspective, I told you, I wrote because <laughs> I was pushed, and then that's the books of Bulafia at the PhD. When I started to write the book on the Golem, I didn't intend to write the book on the Golem at all. But there was an exhibition in New York. So <laughs> I wrote for the catalog, it was too long for the catalog. So, <laughs> so they took a part and I said, okay, I should write a little bit more, it's going to be a small book. But right. I didn't intend to write a right. book on the Golem. Right. I hear you. That is quite, I can demonstrate it. So also other books emerged out of lectures. Right which I was invited and I didn't initiate it, like the book on Hasidism. Right. So it was in Harvard. There was a conference, I believe, in 88, on Hasidism. So I wrote a long article, 
was published a part of it in 91. So I thought, okay, I should work a little bit. So it became a bigger book, but without the conference at Harvard. I don't know. I, almost all my, my books can be explained by accident. <laughs> You, so you say it's accidental, yeah. but I'm very, very glad that it happened because I've, I, for one, and many, many hundreds of people yeah. have been benefactors of your, of your really great work. Yes, but you must see the background. The background was not to change the course of scholarship in Hasidism. Right. But just the lecture I gave at Harvard, and it was long, and I published a part, and then it was a pity that the other part should not be published, so I should work a little bit more, <laughs> and then I worked and became a book. But <laughs> it was in 86, uh, I wouldn't say that I am going to write a book on Hasidis. Right, right, I hear that. There's a, <laughs> it's, it is a funny thing among, among scholars when they're, they're so prolific. You know, they say a joke, who, who, who published something like almost like 500 books? Who was it, uh, Nausner or Klausner? Who was it on, on, rabbinic, on rabbinic thought? Yes. You know who I'm talking about? Neusner. Neusner. They say a joke that a student came to visit him in his office. Yes. And, uh, and he knocked on the door and he said, wait a minute, he's just finishing another book. <laughs> I know him. We met once, twice. He was an extraordinary scholar who had very good ideas, but he didn't have the time to document them. Right. So what happened then, he had a huge impact then. Ask today, people, what happens? He wrote 500 books. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Who is reading today? Oh my God. Why? He had ideas. He was not stupid. And, uh, but he didn't document. Right. So, so that's the, I hope, a big difference. I'm documenting as much as I can. But he did document them. 500 books is, is documents now. <laughs> no, I didn't write 500. I didn't write even, maybe he wrote 30, 40 books. It's, I think I think something I I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to um you're an enigma to me and and I as a as a as a student as mm. a reader as an interviewer I'm trying to mm. unpack this enigma that sits in front of me and I think that perhaps maybe maybe a key to the enigma um which some something that you've mentioned now and many times in previous interviews is your commitment and dedication almost in a in a religious sense to the text itself to the manuscript itself I told the manuscript it's a book uh, meaning, in most of the cases I wrote, uh, pertinent material is found in the manuscript. But when I write on Eliade, for example, yeah. so it's not manuscript. Right. Despite the fact I found a fascinating manuscript right. unknown, unpublished right. by Eliade, but not because I was looking for manuscripts. Okay, so we could take text more broadly. Yes. Text, I believe that uh, in humanities, if you like to trace the development of a thinker, you must uh, read him. How do you read a text? Depends. What text? Meaning that, look, people believe that Kabbalah is a difficult text. Not at all. The most difficult texts are Hasidism. People believe the Hasidism is simple. Kabbalah is relatively simple because they have the structures of Sfirot and Bartofim, and you know what to expect. It can be a nuance or here or there or disagreement, but it is a skeleton. Yeah. And the moment you know, you know. In Hasidism, you don't have such a skeleton. You must understand what's written there, not right. rely on extra. Right. So it depends how do you how do what texts are you reading? Meaning Hasidic texts are very difficult. Not because they are complex, but because they are flexible. And you don't have a starting point which is solid. Right. So you must ponder again and again right. without the system. No system. There are people writing about Hasidim is a system that's uh, hilarious. <laughs> you can imagine those people having systems. People living in, you know, in a village or in the mountains or in a small place. And 
without too many books and they didn't have systems. That's the creation of scholars. Is that true for all of the Hasidic authors? Not all. Chabad? No. Right. Not all. Do Chabad you? not and Rabbi Nachman not, for sure. But there right. are exceptions. Sure, sure. You said in a previous interview that, that a text is more complicated than a person. Reading a text is more difficult than reading a person. Yes and no, because uh, text is uh, fixed and the person is flexible, meaning. Uh, it depends what, meaning. Uh, also, the text has an unconscious issues, and. Um, but I don't use too much uh, psychology. Right. Because I believe that psychology is. Not because I deny psychology, but uh, it's not always helpful. It's an intrusion in a world which uh, I look. In Shanghai, there are not too many psychoanalysts. Why? Because they have another way of life. And, uh, that's basically a Vienna story, with middle Europe story, and there will be New York, which is a counter-export of the... I see psychology as an attempt, a very interesting attempt, to cope with certain situations. But if someone is living in a totally different conditions, as I believe some Hasidic figures were living, I don't believe that's uh, helpful. So, show me how many I can show you in my office. I have an encyclopedia of psychoanalysis, th three volumes, huge volumes. What are they? In what part of the world are they? You can see it's a certain type of culture producing certain forms of complexities, or complexes, or how you like to call it. And Freud and Jung attempted to deal with the problems. However, someone not living in those conditions have other complexes. I don't right. say that they didn't have, they right. have other complexes. You're saying it's not right to apply this one particular Yes. Issue on a, on a yes, to I assume don't that it's universal. Yes, I believe people have the right. Oedipus uh, complex. What can I tell you? I, it's, I want I just want to pull up a quote from from one of your works here, where you speak specifically uh, about textuality. And I thought it was I thought it was quite it was quite interesting. I want to I want to get your get your thought on it. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um. Here it is, here it is. You, you write a comparison between Abu Lafia's work, which we'll yes. come back to, obviously, um, and modern, postmodern, modern and postmodern yes. deconstruction, uh, Derrida and others. Yes. Um, and you write that just as the deconstructive thinkers in postmodernism, they consider language as taking over the author, um, obliterating the importance of authorial intent. You say too that some of the Jewish mystics claim that their own interpretations are transmitted by higher entities, which which is communicating something beyond them, and therefore the the meaning of the text is unstable in some sense. Look, uh, meaning of the text is unstable because the author doesn't exist more, and you cannot ask him. And uh, the interpretation depends on you. But I am not so much, how to put it, committed to deconstruction. For very simple reasons. The construction is based on a certain type of literature which is not religious and not intended to communities. And then you don't know how to how to put it uh, to verify. So you change the text because you don't have a reference. In religious texts, you have references. If someone is writing Tefillin, you know what is Tefillin. Right. 
So we cannot say like Derrida, look, uh, it can be X or Y or Z. Right. Et if someone is writing Shilat uh, Shaharit, you don't go in the night to Shaharit. So you cannot say that it changes in the way a modern text is changing, which is intended by one individual to the unknown individual. So from this point of view, I don't accept deconstruction. It is uh, is good for some forms of literature, but not for other forms of literature. So even someone like uh, Umberto Eco is not always subscribing to Derrida. He told me two jokes about Derrida. One, let's say that uh, the wife of Derrida gave him a list to go to the grocery. A shopping list. Is, shopping. is he returning with what's written in the list or not. It's returning, that's it's wrong. Or let's say that Derrida is, uh, wrote a letter to Echo, that Echo will write him a recommendation. If Echo writes a recommendation, so Derrida is wrong. So that is the issue. The issue is there are no, uh, in modern literature, the references are very scant. And they are changing also, and also in religious literature you have flexibility for sure. But there are some, the way of life is structured and the objects are known. And despite the polemics, even among the polemics, Someone say, between Rabbeinu Tam, between the Rashi, they know what they're speaking about. They can disagree, but they, they disagree about something. Right, right. They agree first. So I'm not, how to put it, using the construction. Not that I don't refer to Derrida. Derrida was a great figure and very important. And there are things to be learned from him. But by and large, I'm not a postmodern. Yes. You, you described your own approach to Kabbalah and to the text of Kabbalah as phenomenological. Yes. What do you mean by that? What, first, I'm using relatively loose. And what I mean is that it's more important to deal with the content of a text rather than uh, history or the background, which are for sure very important. But if you insist too much about what's going on around the text, you lose the text. Mm. So that's what I call phenomenological, meaning what is the content that can be extracted from the text? After you know the context, after you know the author and the date, and the, the text is about something else, not about when it was written or who wrote. So, phenomenological is to put an emphasis on the content, which is the phenomenon of the text. You know, it's written in on pergament or published, those are in, people are wasting their life, you know, trying to find them that uh, the paper was written in the 17th century right. or 16th century. Right. It doesn't affect uh, the text. Right. You want to know what does the text itself have to say? Yes. Right. So th that's what I call right. it. It's interesting because most people talk about phenomenology, about the human phenomena. You're talking here about the textual phenomena. I deal with texts and I don't have access to the persons. Right. When I have access to the person, will be maybe different, but, right. uh, but uh, it's very difficult to have access to the, you know, I spoke with many Kabbalists. Uh, not so simple, meaning uh, they're living in another world. Right. I mean, it's very difficult to communicate. Right. Even if you know Yiddish, right. so it doesn't matter because I don't know if I'm going to ask a Kabbalist 
What was your mystical experience? Chavaya mystic. He doesn't understand what is Chavaya and what is mystic. <laughs> and cannot answer me. You know, if I shall try to explain, it's going to be very clumsy. So it's very difficult to have discussions with Kabbalists because their language is very different. I'll give an example that I'm using a lot. First time they was to... It's very difficult to speak. Yes. With people whose horizons are very, very limited. And I have to explain to them too many things. It is as if I'm indoctrinating them. Right. This you're saying when you're speaking to the Kabbalists, you're saying, yes. right? You were you were gonna bring a you were gonna bring an example. Ah, first time I was in a Kabbalistic uh, yeshiva, I saw it was going to be the last time also. So I decided not to open the book they are studying, but just to listen to them to look at them. And then I hear a, a word which I don't know the meaning in Hebrew, but it it couldn't be there. And the word is Kali. Kali, I know that's a Hindu... The Hindu goddess. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that cannot be asking about Kali in the middle of Jerusalem. So I open the book and I see something very simple, but I didn't know. That Kuf Lamet Yod, which is Klippa, cannot be pronounced Kli, because Kli is something else. Vessel. Right. So they put Kali. They didn't know it has to do it. Now, interesting to see them and to learn how exactly they are studying. But that is a curiosity. Would they open the book? I would see immediately what it means. So, we, not always we can communicate in an effective way. Not that I'm against, I'm not against. I had many discussions to the extent I could manage them, but uh, I'm uh, what I have of text. Right. But it, it's interesting you say that, that you find it hard to communicate with living Kabbalists, contemporary yes. Kabbalists in Jerusalem. No, depend on what, on manuscripts. You know, they are speaking with me because they don't know manuscripts. They want the information and that's no problem. To tell them numbers of manuscripts and the titles and history, and that's no problem. And you, you've been a resource to practicing Kabbalists? Yes, at the beginning, that's the way it started. It right. came to me to, to learn about it because I was reading in the Institute of Microfilms. They were coming there, they didn't know what to look for. Right. They didn't know how right. to look for. Right. Were they surprised to meet someone who was so steeped? in Kabbalistic texts, but was so removed from Kabbalah as a practice and as a belief system? Yourself? No, I didn't understand. Were question. they surprised to meet you? Yes. A person who was so steeped yes. uh, in the knowledge, in the texts, yes. but yet so removed from it in terms of practice, in terms of experience and belief? Look, I don't want to tell you the example that the professor of mathematics is not a triangle. Is not what? A triangle. Right. Meaning I attempt to look in a sympathetic way. I don't criticize Kabbalists or traditional figures, etc. I attempt to be sympathetic, but uh, that doesn't mean that I identify. Right. I myself didn't have mystical experiences. I didn't try. I didn't use Abu Lafia's techniques. And for sure, that's a certain price. But it's a price to use them. Because when you use them, you believe that your experience is his experience. Mm. And that's also a price. Mm. You know, we're living in different millennia almost, in different cultures. And what I would experience using his technique is maybe dramatically different. So if you use it, you can make as great a mistake as mm. not use it. Mm. You feel like it would have compromised 
your own honesty and integrity as a scholar if you would have experienced it for yourself? Is that what you're saying? I must say that I am uh, not afraid of... Uh, I simply... Uh, what is interesting for me is curiosity and not so much uh, to have the experience of. Your curiosity doesn't extend to the experience as no. well? Meaning, would I have, you know, out of the blue, without making any effort and without having any academic commitment, it would be something, may, I mean, if it happens, it right. doesn't depend on me. Right. But uh, I didn't initiate anything. Right. You know, there, there are some easy ways to get there, things like yes. psychedelics. There are some easy ways to bring on what people would consider mystical experiences. Uh, I didn't try by myself, but uh, two friends of mine, I would like not to, scholars, to mention names. When I was once in California, once in the east side, they gave me some drugs, I don't know even what. <laughs> I didn't feel anything. I must say. Maybe you're immune to mysticism because you've read it too I much. Am, <laughs> I am or not, but uh, look, I didn't initiate it. But two good friends who are professors in universities in the United States, I must say I didn't feel anything at all, meaning not something vague, <laughs> anything. Next time you have to increase the dose. Yeah. You have to increase the dose. Uh, yes, but you know, <laughs> they didn't offer to increase the dose. Right. <laughs> right. It's w one of the main uh, characters that you've explored throughout, f for, for decades now, yes. has been the great Kabbalist Avraham Abulafia. Yes. Um, some people say that he's your pet Kabbalist. Like, uh, like Shalom had, had uh, Shabzai Tzvi, for example, that, uh, that he's been a pet Kabbalist for you. And you've, you've really spent a lifetime with the man. Yes. Do you, I'm curious, do you, is there a sense of, we, we said how there's a capacity to, to get to the phenomenon of a text. Do you ever feel that you can get inside his mind, that you know what he's thinking? I am sure that I can identify a text of his having one page. I don't believe that I can, I, can, I know how, how he's thinking. I know his uh, vocabulary. Um, I can imagine what will be his reaction to something theoretical, meaning for questions that right. uh, Hypothetical. Meaning he right. didn't write about. Right. I can imagine what will be, I'm not totally sure, but, uh, but I don't, uh, meaning, I believe he was a fascinating figure, but it's not me alone or so, sure. people like Echo and Derrida. Sure. And, who, I mean, to be fair, largely through you and largely because of you. I believe he was an interesting mind. Can I, ask a, can I ask maybe a bizarre question? Do you love him? To a certain extent, yes. Mm. But the reasons are not exactly the depths. But his courage. Mm. To be himself mm. and not to subscribe, not to, how to put it, to answer all the criticism and to, as a person, I believe that he was fascinating. Yeah. You don't have too many people like this in today's, except of Spinoza or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So love, I don't know exactly, but, but for sure I admire, admire him, him as a thinker. Right. I hear that. I hear that. Why, why did you choose him? Why was that? I mean, you described it as a bit of a mistake before, but, yes. but it's gone beyond that at, at this point, hasn't it? First, uh, meaning, I didn't intend to write about him. I can say I scarcely heard the name. But there was a problem with my PhD on philosophy. Professor Ephraim Gottlieb, who was I was his assistant in matters of Kabbalah. Tell me, look, why don't you write about the commentaries on the Guide of the Perplex of Abulafia? So I thought that's perfect. Right. So I spoke with Pinus, Pinus was reticent, but I decided I'm going to write about it. 
Uh, first, there was a lot of material unknown. A lot. So that's exactly what I was looking for. Meaning things that I can read and don't have to to finish immediately. And then I discovered more manuscripts and there are many issues that I didn't write and I'm writing even now. Look, there are professors of philosophy who, of history of philosophy, or all, all their lives are writing about a philosopher. Of course. So, I don't do it, but uh, given the fact that Bulafia wrote something like uh, 40, 50 books, right. which are difficult. Right. And they are often they are misunderstood. I see nothing bad about it uh, right. to write. Over the years. No, I think it's a wonderful it's, it's a wonderful service. You you brought him in many ways from obscurity back into a reputable place. And I, this is not a fair question because you've written something like half a dozen books on him and, and not just light books. You've written serious, you know, 300 page works. What is it that sits? What's the core of his system? What is it that makes him tick? What's what's the beating heart of Abu Lafia, If you could condense it. I believe that uh, his courage to go against uh, the grain, against the current. To say Kabbalah, that all the Kabbalists are claiming, is not Kabbalah. Yeah. He has another Kabbalah, and he built it to a great extent from the scratch. Yeah. And he had to argue about it. He was excommunicated, and that's uh, the real drama in the history of Kabbalah. Yes. Your Kabbalah people claim I received and okay, I should divulge something. He was very courageous. What, but what's, what's the core point that he's trying to get across in his, in his philosophy, in his own idiosyncratic Kabbalah? That, that he can, can become one with the deity because his intellect and the God as divine is a mind. So they are, it's a radical claim, which even Sholem was afraid to allow. And I believe that uh, the main, how to put it, uh, trigger of creating techniques, how to do it. Attempting to show that is the core of Judaism. Attempts to to unite with God, essentially. Yes. So, this brings us back to to your early work that we were speaking of earlier, which is your new perspectives, where you argue very forcefully and persuasively against Shalom that that union with God, a union with mystic, or the mystical yes. union with God, does exist in Judaism yes. and in abundance, yes. right? And uh, Abu Lafia is one of the, the yes. case examples of that. Yes. Um, you've written a lot on on this concept of union mystica in in Judaism. In, in, in Kabbalah and in, in other earlier Jewish Kabbalah sources. And some other, right. uh, yes. I'm curious, how do you see, I want to I want to open up a bit of a comparative space here. How do you see this concept of uniting with God, union mystica, in Judaism differing from other mystical traditions? Well, there is no one concept. There's one term, but there's no one concept. Before. Someone who is claiming that uh, the most important part of man is mind, so only mystica is a union of intellects. Someone claiming that the soul, so it's a union of the soul. Uh, so there's not one concept of, of union mystica. Uh, to a great extent, the denial, which is very, very Sholemian, meaning that what he claimed that categorically, has to do with an attempt to distance himself from Christian mysticism. To say we have something different on something which is crucial. I believe that that's, that's a hidden agenda mm -hmm. to keep it different. I don't attempt to fuse between them, to say they're the same for sure. But I don't see any problem on the basis of this criterion, yes or no, 
to distinguish. So, for example, on the session in 86, there was a session on the chapter on New Mystica. Yes. The moderator of the chapter was Bernard McGinn. Yes. And from all the, how to put it, chapters, that was the most disputable among Jewish scholars. So he asks McGinn, look, are you persuaded by what I wrote? He told me you are 100% right. right. So we decided on the spot in 86 to write a book on mystical union. In the book, I claim that in Judaism is more than Christianity <laughs> after reading Bernard McGinn. Yeah. I don't see a problem here. Uh, I mean, uh, McGinn could react to what I wrote because we have reactions right. to each other. During the, during the, um, yes. He didn't dispute this claim. Right. So for me, it was incredible. The most important scholar on Christian Methodism right. uh, wanted to write with me a collection of articles on this topic and he read my claim and he didn't dispute it. Right. He could dispute, say, look, you exaggerate or something. We are good friends. We didn't. No. So I believe this important concept in religion. I mean, that's not something secondary. Right. So not to write about it because I wrote already a chapter sometime. Right. So you ended up publishing a work in collaboration with McGee and with, with, with Merker. Yes. On Unumistica in the three Abrahamic faiths. Yes. yes. Um, over there you speak about, about Jewish mysticism and, yes. and Unumistica there. Yes. And in, it's in the context of the other two discussions. But, I'm, but you don't so much directly speak about your own sense of comparison. But you're saying now that in Judaism, it's, it's more present than in Christianity, yeah. which is a wild claim, particularly yeah. coming from Shalom. But I'm, I'm curious, what is the, the, the nature or flavor of Jewish Unumistica that's different than the Christian Unumistica and the Muslim Unumistica in this, for this context? One, because it is uh, active. Meaning, there are techniques how to achieve it. And Christianity is basically passive. It happens to you. You are searching for it. For sure, you are waiting. You are dedicating years to wait for. But uh, you don't have techniques, at least in the Catholic forms of faith. In the Orthodox, Christianity is a little bit different. In Judaism, it is a very active pursuit. It means that you don't wait. You must do. So that's something very, very important. But one of the lectures I gave about techniques, begin, no, not in 86, it was much later. Begin came and told me, look, you don't speak about techniques, you are speaking about magic. Yeah. For him it's magic. Yeah. I understand him. Yeah. I'm using the term technique. Not because I don't believe there's magic in Kabbalah, it's another story, right. but that is a technique. Right. But from the point, his point of view, you cannot force mystical union. Right. Because it's a matter of divine grace. Right. Jews don't speak about grace. That's a huge different difference. Right. It's a real difference. Yes. What's what are, speaking of the techniques, what are some of the primary techniques that the Kabbalists employ? There are many. Abu Lafe has techniques of combination of letters and bracing. Others have other techniques via prayer. There are others, meaning ascetic uh, uh, approaches. Uh, others are like Hasidis, by, by enthusiasm, and I mean, there are different, different forms of approaching. Right. And I assume there are also different experiences. Right. Right. So that's that's on the differences between the traditions. What do you think is common amongst the world's mystical traditions on that front? Even the fact to become to transcend your human condition in a radical way. 
I believe that is uh, shared by many traditions, from yoga up to doesn't matter what. Uh, people transcend their human condition to give the example of uh, stigmata. You know what stigmata? Yes. Stigmata. Something happens to your hand. I don't understand the process, but I believe it. It happens. So to transcend your condition, not psychologically, but also physically. That's a great, how to put it, experience to see this search for transcendence. Right, right. I appreciate you coming back to the human body because after all, that's what's shared amongst the mystics. They all share human yes. bodies in a sense, yes. right? You've done some work on, on neuropsychology and neuroscience and, and mysticism. Yeah. You, wrote a, you, wrote a, you co-wrote a work on that. I, I wonder, do you have a theory of what is it that's happening to these mystics across traditions? Can we talk about a, a universal grammar of experience? Some sort of a, that the self is being dissolved. Is, is there something that's happening because they're sharing a human psyche and human bodies? No, that my answer has to do with the answer to psychology. Why don't you have in Judaism stigmata? Because we don't have a crucified okay. Messiah. So, so what is unifying? Everyone has his experience according to his mystical universe or magical universe, doesn't matter. And uh, we should look in the framework for what happens. So what is unifying? The attempt to transcend death, transcend, uh, how to put it, from time to time even the community. That search for transcendence seems to me to be unifying. Right. Someone dealing with yoga, someone dealing with the Hasidis. They are not the same. Where does is, where is that unified experience or um, unified report where, where is that coming from why 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 are people across traditions across time experiencing this desire and result of transcending the because the they are not happy <laughs> you know, what can i tell you you know they are not happy with their condition they want something more so there is some deficiency in i don't know where in childhood, in mature life, in career, and someone who like more. Since I didn't aspire to anything, so I didn't miss anything. <laughs> do you think? Do you think Plato's formulation of the theory of the forms and Plato in the Republic? Yes. His the allegory of the cave and the theory of the forms. Do you think that articulation is coming from a place of, of lack that he's looking for something more, something more real? For sure. Look, that's a, for sure Plato understood very well that we're living to a great extent in the world of illusion. So we're looking for something stable. The cave story is what is stable. And uh, it became a big, a big, uh, how to put it, uh, metaphor in mysticism. People are looking for something stable, that's also transcendence. People believe that what they are, it's transient. Do you think that the that the Jewish mystics do something positive with this search for transcendence, with this sense of um, of lack? Do they do they do something good with it? Look, most of the Jews didn't have any problem with their condition. They were normal, how to put it, common people. There were people who had other aspirations. Well, I don't say that it's Judaism. Hmm. It is found in Judaism because Judaism is a religion of many, many people. Yeah. And there are people having other aspirations. 
most of the cases in someone aspires to be a chazan. In the moment he's chazan, that's his world. Right. Okay, right. that's fine. It's transcendence right. of his non-chazan experience. Right. There are people who knew Talmud by heart, like Solomon Maimon, and he wanted more. Right. He wanted philosophy right. and Kant and uh, so. People like uh, Solomon Maimon, for sure, was not happy, despite the incredible capacities he had. So he wanted to convert, he wanted to criticize everyone, right. he wanted to do that. Not because he was stupid, because he was super intelligent. So, for sure, this search for transcendence is different in different people and have different prices. And uh, I don't know if different attainments that I simply don't know. I take them by words. It's what they wrote, it's what they felt. Right. It's, it's incredible thinking about what they did with this drive for transcendence, though. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine a Judaism today without Kabbalah. Like, what, yes. what would that look like? Yes. Can, can you? What would it be like if that phenomenon didn't exist? Where would we be? Look, there was never a Judaism without, without some form of mysticism. Meaning, uh, the assumption that in a certain moment Kabbalah emerged and that filled the gap, that's not true. Start with Rabbi Akiva. He was praying, in the middle of prayer, he was, you know, next to so Rabbi Akiva, you know? So was it Rabbi Akiva, not Rabbi Akiva of the Echalot literature, Rabbi Akiva of the Mishnah. Right. So you can say that uh, there was no mysticism there, as a form of mysticism, but it was ecstasy. Rabbi Akiva. Yes. So, Sinav, Rabbi Ishmael having this experience of uh, God. That yes. It's in Talmud, it's the beginning of the Talmud. So how can someone claim that there was Judaism without, in a certain moment, something came in, intruded? Right. But that's not true. Right. You know, they, they take the book of uh, Psalms. It's very mystical. The Shuvit Yashem What can be more mystical? To have God in, in one's yes. presence at all times. No, no. Yes. So, so why assume that there was ever some form of uh, Judaism, including Galacha, that was totally divorced of mysticism? Right. That's, I mean, that's uh, the runs against uh, facts. How are you defining mysticism for sake of, of this point? Uh, look, uh, there are many definitions of mysticism. The definition I prefer, not that uh, explains everything, a mysticism is the search for a contact. The, the search for a contact with something greater than you. It can be God, it can be a spherot, it can be intellect, it can... Part of your, a very important part of your scholarship has been showing the internal continuity Yes. Of, of Jewish mysticism from yes. Talmudic sources from from antiquity to the Middle Ages, right against earlier trends of scholarship which saw discontinuity and external yes. external like infiltration. But that's a traditional society, <laughs> which you know it's that's normal, right? Meaning the attempt to explain history only on the basis of ruptures. Seems to me to be almost incredible. Seem, uh, what? Almost incredible. Incredible. Meaning, people use the same language, the same basic text, the same way of behavior for 2,000 years. And to say, ah, there were ruptures. So, yes, there are ruptures and some issues. I don't say that, no. But also, my mind is a rapture. Right. So there are raptures which are part of 
development, if you like to call it so, enrichment, however you like, but to insist only on those issues and not to see continuity. So, my mind was against Kabbalah, would he speak with the Kabbalists? But he could speak with them. They, they had a common language. Yes. They would understand each other, they would disagree. But nevertheless, they could understand each other. Right. It's, it's, there's, there's some irony here because you've returned in some senses to what's a very traditional perspective on Kabbalah. That Kabbalah self-identifies and is seen as, as part of an ancient tradition. Look, uh, I don't believe that uh, if someone is uh, agreeing with some part of Kabbalah, he is uh, mistaken by definition. <laughs> if someone shows that I am wrong, I am wrong. But uh, to say uh, that's, you know, diminishing to the Kabbalah, I don't say the Kabbalah is ancient. I claim Kabbalah is late 12th century. But there are ideas of Kabbalah which are found earlier. I don't see any problem. Also, Shodom would say, ah, yes, Kabbalah they are Gnostic views, which are earlier. True? Okay, so what is the dispute between us? You say it's one co form of complete, uh, right. continuity, right. Say another form of complete. I mean, you're, you're, you're downplaying the difference a little because you're, you believe that Gnosticism itself is a Jewish. Phenomena that not, I believe, I must say, that's not my view, it is a view of scholars. Right, right. As I quote, you right. know, that I didn't invent this. Uh, okay, I shall sure. tell you a story, a real story. In 89, I received a letter from Hans Jonas, the scholar of Gnosticism. Yes. He wanted to meet me. I was a little bit surprised that I didn't know his life. And, he wanted to meet me. So he came to Jerusalem and we had a discussion. He read the Kabbalah perspective and he was very angry. Angry? <laughs> angry, very angry. He told me, you said that Gnosticists are Jewish elements. I said, yes. So no, they were anti-Semites. So I told them, look, that's not my view. I quote scholars, why don't you argue with them? Right. What do you, why? You came to argue with me when it's not my, my idea. Right. Then he told me, ah, but you said it from Jerusalem. Uh -huh. So, okay, so that's not an argument for me. So, that's a development in scholarship of Gnosticism done by non-Jewish and Jewish scholars who claim there are Jewish elements and they wrote about it. Right. So, if I adopt something like that, it means that, uh, uh, you know, that I adopt the Kabbalistic view, you know, that scholars, serious scholars, which I see no reason not to quote them. Right. But I don't say that Kabbalah is ancient. But I say there are ideas in Kabbalah which are earlier. Right. And I don't say that uh, Sholem wouldn't say about other things that early. I say, but it's Gnostic. So what? Right. If if one wouldn't know better, it almost one could one could almost assume or or read a hidden agenda in your work. Yes. Which is which is a very traditional agenda, arguing for 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 the antiquity of, the, of these ideas, arguing for the centrality of the mitzvot, the rituals. I mean, your in your defense, you'll say that those are just that's what's there in the text. But yeah, look, um, look, you come yeah. up with a very traditional like, reading look, of Kabbalah in the look, end. Look. As I said earlier, traditional or not, if someone has a problem, he must show specifically what it is. Right. <laughs> if he, otherwise, it's just an epitheton. So that's traditional, so what? Traditional is wrong. Right. Okay, show me it's wrong. Right. I have no problem right. with it. Right. More than just traditional readings, when I read your work, I grew up in a Chabad family. Yes. So my approach to Jewish mysticism is entirely mediated through Chabad Hasidism. Yes. And I'm, I'm very well aware of that. When I read your works, I read, I read your Messianic Mystics, for example. Yes. And you're talking about the interior process, the, 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 the inner psychology, the inner redemption, yes. which to me, when I'm, when I'm used to reading other scholars on Kabbalah, they're talking about something which is far away and up in supernal realms, 
and the interior reading seems like a almost like a Hasidic reading. But yet, that's the reading which you're bringing back to the Kabbalists themselves. So, do you believe that? Do you believe that that is? It was part of life. I mean, the people have inner life. <laughs> I mean, even a psychoanalyst would say that people have inner light, and that's very important. That's shaping their life. And to say that everything is economical or social or political uh, is better. What I say is that uh, I see it uh, as common places. That I, people don't want uh, to, to confront it and to say, look, Messiah is someone who doesn't have an inner life. He is coming only to make propaganda. So, okay. I see no problem with it. You know, I, I don't see here first Abu Lafayette saying that Messianism is an inner story. And there are many other Kabbalists saying before Hasidism. So someone is arguing with something like that. You know, I brought examples. I wrote a book, uh, not just an ideological book. Bringing examples. The people deserted the inner life in favor of social movements. Because, uh, in a way, they didn't take seriously the material. They didn't take seriously what? They didn't take seriously the material. The material, in here, in, in their reading of it. You can, uh, you know, imagine someone who declares that he's the Messiah and didn't have an inner life before. Just in the morning, <laughs> he decided, you know, For in the afternoon, reasons. I'm going to TV and I'm declaring myself the Messiah. Why? Because that's a good idea. <laughs> you can imagine something like that. Something uh, abrupt. Right. Right. So, what I say is something I believe very easy to to understand. Right. And much more practical. Right. Rather than the idea that, okay, Sabbath actually had a revelation out of the blue, he's the Messiah. Right. For sure, he had an inner life. We know. We know about Sabbath actually. So. I hear what you're saying, and it's, and it's true, but it does seem to me like you do choose certain lines of thought or areas of inquiry to 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 focus on i mean some of your latest work is on the divine feminine the, the privileged divine feminine yes. right and and you're saying that that's that's in the text and you're showing the text and you do that very finely yes. but but there's certainly and, and there's the, you have your own inner life and you're making choices on why you want to focus on femininity or on uh in, interiority look i believe in what Sholem wrote for many years that you know Kabbalah is basically androcentric 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 yes. but can I do as I found with the time takes which don't work exactly so his explanation the Shekhinah is out of the blue came from Gnosticism or from Christianity according to other explanations when you can find in Babylonia a term named Shintu, who is feminine, running a palace. So, so I found sometime, I don't remember when, that there is a concept named Shintu in Babylonian religion dealing with a clearly feminine figure who is some form of a runner of a palace. So, do you believe that the emergence of the term Shina in Rabbinism is just an accident? He didn't know how to put it, uh, Hebrew grammar and made a mistake. Right. We say Shina is okay, it's Shina, but it's masculine. And then it turned to be feminine. No. That's serious. So not that I discovered or had the inclination. I explained to you why. Because there is such a term. 
And this issue was neglected by the scholars. And they made efforts to evade the feminine aspects of the Shekhinah before Kabbalah. And it doesn't work always. And so I don't believe they have an agenda. I'm, I have a, here a fact. You know, to, you know, first I found that Shekhin too is, and then, then I wrote in Kabbalah and Kabbalah Neros, etc. And then I discovered a small article by an Israeli scholar, and that's important, about the root Shin Kafnun Nakadin. Mm. He doesn't know what Shina, but he's saying it's feminine. Mm. So, two different, exactly the same root. Oh, what can I do? What can I do <laughs> if I see something like that? To say, ah, look, be cautious. Don't push against the feminist, because that's a feminist. Prejudice to say there is no feminine aspects of the Shekhinah. It's a feminist prejudice to say that there's no. It's feminist. a feminist project because the feminists would like to show that there is something wrong. Hmm. Something wrong. Hmm. So I don't say the Kabbalists were better husbands or not. I may uh, how to put it semantic. Remark, if you can show me, you you know for sure that Shmuel Malachim born in Babel, true. So what's the Shina came from Babel? Right. What's the problem? Right. Shmuel Tachodashim born in Babel. Right. The names of the months, the Hebrew months. No. Yes. So I said, no, why well, Shina didn't come? Right. Now she remains there. Right. No. Right. It's funny that you mentioned that. It is. It is traditional. What I said here or not? Half, half yes, half, half no. Half, okay. <laughs> so you see that what can be traditional may not the moment can turn anti traditional. Right. Look, yes. this claim about the Shina. I mentioned it several times to scholars dealing with Shina. I told them, look, you don't have to believe me. Just open a dictionary of Assyrian and see what's written there. No one did it. <laughs> No one say, look, there's a person enigma here. Okay, there is something there, but people don't open the dictionary written by people who had no, no idea about Kabbalah, no agenda. <laughs> so I commented twice to a certain scholar who wrote about Shina, that uh, uh, Christian influence, he didn't open the dictionary. Right, that's, that's problematic. <laughs> so that is... Uh, that's, that's serious. Tell me something. I want to. I want to. I want to jump back to something that we said just a second earlier, which is the centrality of mitzvot as, yes. r as rituals to unite with, with yes. the divine. Uh, and you've highlighted a few of them that the Kabbalists highlight, which is prayer, and which is Torah study, and which is and the general, all the general yes. mitzvot. What if you can give a bit of a sort of a panoramic view of the Kabbalistic thinking? How does the performance of a mitzvah, of a Jewish ritual commandment, um, unite one with God. Because it seems like a strange And not, of them, not all of them claim that it's united with God, but, but uh, first, they have the, mythology, uh, the etymology. Mitzvah like tzevet. So they believe that mitzvah is tzevet. What is tzevet? Tzevet is so, to be together. Mm -hmm. Tfila. Like Ptila, that's to mean by their etymology, they claim that there are moments, and the moments differ from one case to another. Either gods you are sent to God via prayer, or you attract God down via right. prayer. Right. So there's those two different issues. But uh, what is in common is the shared assumption that this is the moment of communion with God. Right. If you go there, he's coming here, that's a that's, uh, small detail. Technicality. Yes. 
but uh, but the conviction that that is the moment because that is the normal life and people attempt to elevate their normal life and not to there was no in Judaism there was no monastery no monks and you cannot have special form of life like in Christianity or like in Islam or like in Hinduism so you are living with people you don't have institutions so you are keeping to the institutions you have communal institutions ritual institutions the commandment right and it, it creates a very almost like a terrestrial form of mysticism it's very embedded in everyday life yes okay so just not so very spiritual and people have a problem with it right and uh, scholars what's the problem you know you know the book of uh shatz of Muhammad. Hasidism was mysticism. Mm. She wanted to have the Hasidim like, you know, the Christian mystics. Right. Ah, that's, you know, it's fila, that's mental prayer. Mm. What do you mean mental prayer? There's no mental prayer in Judaism. Mm. You can say belachash, okay? Belachash is not mental prayer. So this, you see an uneasiness in scholarship with this corporeality of so, <laughs> what can I tell you, you know, the texts are running against it. Is that something unique to Jewish mysticism, that sense of um, com communality and bodiliness and everydayness? Look, other, other uh, religions have other institutions for it, where you can cultivate something which can be called more spiritual. In today's, it doesn't matter how mystical you are, you must come in the morning to the Minyan. That we know from the Hasidic, from the Hasidic comments on, on, on Moses. Moses was there, but he came down. So, so the structure of the religion. You cannot escape because you cannot live outside. You don't have the conditions to live in monasteries or alone. In Orthodox Christianity, people are living in the mountains, you know, in caves like the Besht. So the Besht was a little bit there, but uh, he returned. Right. So, Even the, the Ari, before he makes his way to Tzfat, is also living monastically. He was, he was at least partially yeah, for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing. But I'm speaking people living 40. Ish. Right. If you read the uh, Fathers of the Desert, right. people are living 40 years, 50 years, like two, two weeks, two right, weeks. Right, right, right. <laughs> you have a, you, you resist any form of um, essentialism, saying that this is Kabbalah, or this is Judaism, that's something that you resist Energy, yes. quite, quite strongly. But, um, but when, you, when you write about the, the practice in Judaism, um, you, you say that the, that the emphasis on the techniques and the performance of the mitzvot uh, in the spiritual and inner life of the Jewish mystic yes. um, is, something, is, is the deep structure of classical Judaism, yes. the phrase you use. Yes. So, is, do, do, if, if you were to try and venture a, a, an essence of Jewish mysticism, would that be the direction that you would, that you would look for it in? That seems to me to be inevitable. We have books about, written only about Tabi Mitzvot. How many books do you have of Tabi Mitzvot? You have tens of books, lengthy books. In my opinion, the most important books. So, <laughs> why argue with those books? And you see the people living, not just writing, living in such a way. Have a lot of reports. So what is the issue to take to take issue with it? What about what about what about people like the Italian Kabbalists who are less focused on mitzvot? Yes, and but the Italian Kabbalists were not very ascetical. So they were living in society. 
what society is another story. Also Jewish, also Christian, but they were not monks. The Italian Kabbalists, Jewish were not monks. They were married, they had children, they were living in a society, while they were monks in Italy. So that's a difference. Right. And, and, and also you point out that they never really did become part of mainstream Jewish mysticism. They did become mainstream, but uh, for other reasons. But, but uh, because they were acculturated to a powerful culture. And people today don't like it. But if you look to themselves, all of them were buried. Married. Buried. All of them, I assume, keep the commandments plus minus. We don't know. They are not excommunicated. Right. We don't hear about uh, being heretics. Right. So, right. so Italian Kabbalists were different, but no, not all of them were right. different, and they were not so different. What do you think of the Italian Kabbalists' perennialism? Yeah? Their perennialism. I don't accept uh, perennialism as a way of thinking. Uh, I believe that's uh, an invention. Yeah, there are strong, how to put it, uh, directions toward uh, perennialism. In Eliade, or Corbin, uh, Jung, uh, I don't accept them. Beyond Perennialism, you have always something very particular. It takes time for you to identify what is this particular perennialism. So, Jung is basically Christianity, and Corbin is Islam, Neliade is archaic. Everyone has his perennialism. They were together in Eranos, and they at least agree about the perennialism. But there's nothing like perennialism. Even there, they don't agree about what it is. Right. You've also been to Iranus. I was there several times. But not as a perennialist. No, no, not at all. I was. What I published there doesn't differ from anything I wrote before or later. And were you, are you comfortable there? Are you accepted there? I was not the Eranos of uh, Eliade and Sholem and uh, Corbin and Jung. You were dead already. And the Eranos I was there was another structure. I don't know what was beyond the renewal of Eranos, but in any case, I published what is there, and I didn't subscribe ever to perennialism. And I criticized it. Also, Sholem didn't, didn't subscribe to it while he was there. Right. True. Do you do you think that the perennialists are? You think that, that they're wrong because they're they're ignoring the particularity, right? Is that what you're saying? There is no perennialism. There are different forms of perennialism, but I told you each of them has a certain agenda. Right. Do you think that there's a potential to to focus on on the common amongst the traditions and to and to? Is it done? They don't emphasize the common. Who doesn't? The perennialists? Yes. They claim that, but they, look, what they do, they translate the other in their term. Right. But that's not a fair game. Like you translate all the problems of people to the Oedipus complex. So it's a translation. And then you have a complex, and that's, uh, according to Jung, at least some form of per but, but that's, uh, how to put it, you infuse your mythology in the text. Do you think it's possible to not do that? Do you think it's possible to, to construct commonality without It is not possible, totally possible not to do it, but uh, we must first be aware of it and be as cautious as possible to prevent it. Meaning, all of us, uh, some unconscious uh, views, and, but uh, I can easily 
control myself to see that I don't do it. I mean, there is uh, that you can call it certain form of instinct because it's simplifying and that is giving you the clue and that's very nice to write books about it. But uh, scholarship is exactly about it. Exactly. Not to subscribe. Right. Right. To the instinct, to the easy, to the what is make you a public figure, and all those issues are not scholarly. They are form of egotistic uh, enterprises, and uh, we must be aware that we have this instinct. But uh, what is scholarly is to transcend it. It's interesting because when I first reached out to you and I emailed, when I first emailed you, yes. I reached out for the interview, and I signed my name yeah. and then the name of, of my project which is seekers of unity yeah. and you responded very kindly yes the interview but you said i'm not here for unity and you said you're here for plurality yes i remember yes I'm, and i'm curious about that because to me that it seemed to me it seemed that the mystics yes. both in judaism and outside are seeking unity yes the unity their unity that's true their unity each of them is looking for the unity that everyone should subscribe, which is their unity. <laughs> no, I can tell you a story about the story, the text of uh, Levi Yitzhak Hoberdichev. That uh, for sure we pray, and we pray by letters, and Hebrew letters, but all the others cannot pray. They don't have the letters, but those are the letters. Controlling the universe. That is unity. But unity for us. Some form of kuzari. In the moment you say that unity for me, and don't say it is unity, and you deny to the other very explicitly. So there's not unity. There's disunity. That's, that's certainly true of many mystics that are doing a very particularistic, ethnocentric, uh, ontolinguistic form yeah. of their own unity. But, but I think there are some characters, and I think you see them coming out of the Italian Renaissance, Jewish characters, that are trying to do something more expansive, more universal. You are right. There was such a tendency, which is a Greek tendency. Greek, because the Greeks believed that they have the explanation of the cosmos. And this Greek uh, approach exploded again in the Renaissance. And their claim was not that the universe, they say, ah, the Kabbalah is very nice. They are telling us exactly the Christian. So we must translate the Kabbalah. Right. And that's what they are doing. They are right. translating. Right. So this expansion is not exactly universal. It's very particular. Right. Those, those that are starting it, yes. like Pico and Ficino, are doing that. But those, but the Jews that take it back from them are not trying to read Christianity into Kabbalah. They're trying to read Kabbalah outwards to the world, right? I don't say that automatically all of them are the same. I, you know, you mentioned Renaissance, so I told you, Renaissance is very, very Christian. What about someone like Herrera? He's not a Christian. Like? Herrera, Avram Cohen to Herrera. He's not uh, universalistic. He's philosophically oriented, influenced strongly by the Renaissance, and attempted to be more, how to put it, uh, universalistic than others. But uh, Luria is the real truth, but must be interest. So there's no difference between him and the Christian Renaissance. He attempted to be a Jewish. Christian Renaissance. Right. <laughs> so that's a well, that's a good way to put it. Do you think that there's anything, do you think that the mystics say anything true about reality? About? Reality? Yeah, I don't know what reality is, so I cannot tell you, you know, is it for sure that they are saying something true because they are part of reality. <laughs> Even if they imagine everything, that's still part of reality. What do you mean you don't know what reality is? I simply don't know. 
reality is changing. What does it mean? Reality in a certain moment? Reality is, uh, is static. It's not changing everything. But, but you just said something about reality, so that it's changing. You know something about reality. So, if you like to say that reality is changed, it's fine. But that we know from, you know, from <laughs> astrophysics, that everything is changing. In, including the laws of nature, right. which are changing. Right. But the Kabbalists are making metaphysical truth claims about reality, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they do. Right. So? Um, I'm curious, do you think, do you, do, you, do, you, do you find any of their metaphysics to be compelling or persuasive? Look, for me, metaphysics, like theology, are another need to offer meaning and even to transcend by creating an alternative reality. Today, it's not exactly in after Nietzsche and others to speak about uh, metaphysics was philosophically speaking in decline in the last 150 years or something like that. So people are reticent about and they are turning much more to language. Right. Not that the language is uh, much better. But, so they are criticizing also language. Do you have no need for meaning? Yes, I assume that in family and, you know, for sure there's meaning. The, the problem with this meaning is, uh, how to put it, atemporal, universal. For sure that's, uh, I would like to finish a book its meaning, but it's going to disappear afterwards. Without meaning, people don't do too many things. Do you find meaning in the Kabbalists after spending your lifetime studying them? I don't know if I find meaning. I found, uh, I would say, joy by doing it. I enjoy it. I don't, you know, I go in different directions and I enjoy the fact that it's different discover new new views. People like call it meaning, I don't know. But what do you enjoy about it? First, I learned something new. That's very, very important. Otherwise, I could stop writing many years ago or to repeat myself all the time. So, why to write is a very difficult experience. I mean, you must read and the others and argue and so it's a difficult issue, but I do it because I enjoy. You enjoy, you're still, you're still curious and you're still, you're still passionate about I'm writing books right. based on new material. Right. And I hope also new approaches shows that I enjoy it, it otherwise I won't do it. It doesn't get boring after a lifetime? Don't you feel at a certain point that you've seen everything already? I didn't see anything. I know for sure that I didn't see. I, mean, I have no illusion that I did see. And even if when, I reading, when I'm reading again, I see that I have another view than 40 years ago. So it's the same. Right. Yeah. You, you, re you republished recently a new work on, on Abu Lafia after you've already exhausted the new work right. and I hope to publish more right. unknown you, material. Can I ask, what are you working on right now that's exciting for you? On a book on Hasidis. Can you be a bit more specific? It's not a specific uh, book, but uh, with the emergence of Hasidis and why Hasidis succeeded. The question is uh, not how has this emerged, but how has it succeeded? You can imagine some few people, Rebesh and some students and the students of his students, or what? The problem is how something like that became a movement. It was a text that's immaterial. The text actually didn't affect it. So there is something in Judaism or in Ashkenazi Judaism 
that allowed it to emerge and to succeed up to today. So that is the issue, the real issue. Not if this coming from Sabatanis was coming from Luria, is coming from there. That's an important issue, but it doesn't does answer the question why it succeeded. Why did it succeed? Because they were Ashkenazi. <laughs> It's a bit racist. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great discovery. It's the great discovery is that the that the Chassidim were Ashkenazim. Yes. <laughs> you know that people claim that it was a Sidur Sfaradi. True. Right. People checked it. I'm assuming not. And Minhag was also Sfaradi, right? I'm not so sure. <laughs> Open it, we'll see. In, you know, on the Kiachofar. All the angels there. That's pure Ashkenazi. That's found among the Faradi. When you say Ashkenazi, you mean all the way back to Chassidi Ashkenazi, yes. right? So, that's very important. It's right. an important moment, not just the detail. Sure. Not in Nusach. Sure. Okay, for example. So, But what's the significance of them being Ashkenazi? Why does being Ashkenazi contribute to their success? There are many non-successful Ashkenazis. Like and that's a long story. There's not. There's no one single. But you're saying because they were, because they were part of the culture which they were working They're in. Part of the culture. Yes. That's Hasidis what you're saying. Part of the Ashkenazi culture because it's Ashkenazi. It's very simple. Mm. And and because they were at home, they were able to be yeah. to be picked up. I believe it's a simple question, also a simple answer. And previous movements, Excuse me? previous movements, they they weren't indigenous to their own cultures. I don't, I don't want to generalize. I'm speaking about a movement which exists already two hundred fifty years or more. Right. Okay. So that remained part of the culture, quite powerful, and despite all the attacks and the Moderna and whatever. So why not attempt to understand it? Why? But do you think that that fully answers the question? I mean, there are many movements that are indigenous to a culture that don't go anywhere. It's, it seems that there doesn't... It's not my business. No, but it seems like you haven't answered the question by saying that they're Ashkenazi. It, it seems that... I know. I. I shall ask in the, I shall answer in detail. You know, not that, uh, the book is not about uh, a title, you know. <laughs> I mean, I gave you an example, no? Yes, I hear. An example which is assuming that that is not Ashkenazi. The example par excellence. But I'm asking that being Ashkenazi itself is not enough of a reason seemingly for, for the incredible success of the Hasidic movement. It seems that there may have been something Depends else. Depends how do you understand Ashkenazi? I'm sure you don't know your culture, Ashkenazi culture. You don't know it. So what do you? You mean? read the Lazaro forms? No. No. So okay. <laughs> so enough. So what do you? You like me? You like to make, make you a list of what you didn't read, it's Ashkenazi? <laughs> what are you meaning when you say Ashkenazi? It's many things. It's not the uh, one. You know the best read Sefer Aziel Malach. Sefer Aziel Malach is 80% Ashkenazi. No scholar opened the book to quote one line. And the book, the Besh studied. Why? It's not important. It's not Sabbatean, right. it's not Lurianic. Right. And, it's not exciting. <laughs> but there you have there. And other forms and other texts which are Kabbalistic texts which are not Ashkenazi but influenced by the Ashkenazi. What, what is the genius of Ashkenaz? I, I don't say it's a genius. I say that's an inclination. That's a traditionalist. Traditionalist. But inclination is enough to explain the, the yeah, huge success? But that's important. Success? It's not everything. Right. And I don't claim that uh, Hasidism is Hasidic Ashkenaz. Right. For sure not. Right. But they are still part of the same culture. Right, right. And not to ask this question seems to me to be bizarre. Right, right. So maybe my answers are going to be partial. Okay. Right. 
Because to me, it seems that, that Hasidism does something, does something which is really tremendous yes. in their emphasis on, on simplicity, on, in, on sincerity. Because not only Ashkenazi. I didn't say that everything is Ashkenazi. Right. They are also simply right. they are not Ashkenazi. Right. But we're speaking about why it succeeded. Right. For sure, there are other ingredients which are Kabbalistic and magical. Right. For sure. The Baal Shem Tov has been a topic of yours, of your recent scholarship for some time now. The figure of the Baal Shem Tov. Ever, I mean, ever since your work on Yes, but you know, I'm earlier. going to write a book about it. I thought that I'm going to write this book on Baal Shem Tov. It turns to be on Hasidis. Right. I should right. return to write right. something about right. Baal Shem Tov. Right. I'm, I'm curious, from when you started studying Baal Shem Tov until yeah. today, how's your thinking about him changed? I think it was someone who came from a very low background, maybe family, but rather ignorant, who was very intelligent and was able to change all the time. And given those changes, he could bring in his circle many people. For sure, he was extraordinarily intelligent. And he was what people are calling charismatic. I don't like the term. Uh, he was very important, but I don't believe that that is the answer for the emergence of this. It is good to answer the first generation, people who knew him. After two generations, people had stories, but the charisma it didn't work. And the problem is why people who didn't know him, despite the fact they told very important stories, they still kept with Hasidism. That cannot say because of the Baal Shem Tov. Okay, Baal Shem Tov is good for the Magid, for right. Jacob Yosef, right. or if he... In his own individual yes. charisma, right? Fine. Right. Maybe a generation more. Right. But, but, but there was no Hasidism there. Well, perhaps then it was his innovations, what he introduced, his teachings. So, the, the issue is why I'm writing it, is, you know. Right. I have some... I, I did something preparing for your interview because b because you really have. One second, let me just adjust this closer to you. Are you enjoying the conversation? Fine. I see you. You have, did, you have done a lot of work. I, I appreciate that you that you see that. Um, I did. I I think you're an important scholar, and I wanted to give the time that it deserved to prepare for it. Part part of the challenge of of interviewing you, um, as we said earlier, is is how many themes. That you that you've that you've covered and you've and you've discussed in your work, and I was a bit nervous sitting down with you of, of what exactly to discuss. So I went around to some of your colleagues and students here, and I asked them, "I'm going to be sitting with Professor Udell. What should I ask him?" And I got some I got some interesting questions from them. Yeah. I want to do a bit of like a, what they call a lightning round. I'll ask the questions, and you and you give, can give a short answer to each question. How does that sound? We'll try. We'll try. Good. <laughs> so the first question is. What is the most important thing for you in your research? That I enjoy it. <laughs> what, what do you think is your most important article? Maybe most important article is a small article named Amakshavara Ashalael. The, the evil thought of God. Evil thought of God. Yes. Which I was sure this was not, never going to be published. And it was published immediately. And then it became a book to me, evil, evil. Why is that your most important work? Because it gave another line, historically speaking. Uh, Sholem claims that uh, Gnosticism, and my claim is that there are some elements which are Zoroastric. Mm. And that Sholem thought in Tishbi that uh, Luria invented all this vision of catharsis. Right. And I believe it was found much earlier. Following up on that theme, what's your what's your most important book in your estimation? I believe the most important book is a book on messianism, which in my opinion didn't receive enough attention. I loved it. But if you look, people still are writing books named the messianic idea. 
Aí se fizeram o Oze Messiânico aquele dia. Assim, o Boss Colors, não sei o que é o Boss. É muito bizarro para mim. Não que eles estão allowed to do whatever they want, but at least to. Acknowledge. To, 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 not to acknowledge, at least to explain right. why there is a messianic idea. Right, right. So, and so you're saying that was the that was the the most important point that you were trying to make there. Yes. Um, what do you think of the the general state of mysticism in the world today, in the public? I mean, uh, what happened? The ideology declined. Uh, the economic situation is much better. People attempt to escape dangers. So that's escapism. People can afford to do it. Earlier they didn't. Earlier they had other alternatives. And you can see how people are shifting from an ideology to mysticism. You think it's because of the, the plentifulness that we have and, and the desire to escape? I see that there uh, are two big attempts uh, in the 20th century, uh, communism and capitalism. Actually, they were ruined by reality, if you have to call it so. So people don't believe in it. Right. So they're looking for something different. Right. And mysticism, not only mysticism, but mysticism is one of the roots. Do you feel like you were maybe disillusioned by ideology because of your upraising in, in Romania? Yeah, I was disillusioned uh, already in Romania. Meaning, uh, my claim is that I never met a communist in Romania. I, were, I studied the communists, but by people who didn't believe in it, but right. they had to teach it. Right. After a while, I believed at the beginning, and afterwards I understood that already in Romania, that's not... So my disillusion is not here, it was already there. Right. Why do you think that Kabbalah as a field of research is so successful today? Because Mr. Tish is successful, so also the scholarship is, is, is exactly the same. Unfortunately, from time to time, they overlap. Unfortunately? Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, people, you know, take too seriously the claims of the mystics as scholars. Hmm. Scholars take the claims of the mystics yeah. too seriously. Can you give me an example? No, it's better not to give examples, but unfortunately there are many. <laughs> No, I didn't mean an example of a name. I meant an example of an idea. No, I prefer not to answer the question. Okay, sure. Um, what do you What do you enjoy outside of Kabbalah? Uh, well, in different parts of life. I mean, it's not exactly uh, one one's music, chess. Now, family. Hmm. You You have grandchildren. Yes. They They give They bring you nachas. Very much. I'm glad to hear. Um, what's your What's your perspective uh, in general on the on the contemporary state of the scholarship of of mysticism and Kabbalah? There is too much. Too much scholarship. Too much scholarship, which uh, is a problem because people cannot read. Mm. It's too much to read. Or read superficially. And then creates a lot of uh, disputes and a lot of waste of time. I prefer to have less, but better. What's the remedy? How do you get? How do you get to that? No remedy. <laughs> Is that a structural problem? In it's the... no, no remedy. The problem is very deep because also the university is encouraging it. It's not only a personal story. Right. Encouraging everyone to write. Yes, to write, to publish. Right. It's funny because the sages of the Talmud, when they bless each other, they bless that they should have many students. They should increase the scholarship. Yes, yeah, but uh, look, the situation, not that I say that everything is bad, you know, for sure not. They are very fine scholars. But uh, you asked in general. Right. Who were some, who was some, some 
promising scholars that, that, that you see on the horizon? I look at the answer, you know. There are, there are many and everyone believes it is. <laughs> he, she is the best. Um, what, what has changed, if you're looking at the field of, of the scholarship of Jewish mysticism, from when you started until today? Both, no, both for the good and the negative. Very simple. I mean, once it was one idea dominating. And there was Sholem. People can dispute with Sholem, but it was Sholem. Right. Now, there's nothing like that. Everything is much more open, and much more diffuse. But you're a fan of diffusion and plurality and... I have no problem with it. I <laughs> say it's fine. But, you say, but you're saying that, the, that, the, that the, the extent of it is maybe too much. I was very specific about what is too much. That people, too much is created and written hastily right. and people are reading superficially and then they are disputes. Too much quantity, not enough quality. Yes, that's... Okay, I got you. That's the issue. Not, yeah. I didn't say that too much is by itself bad. But when people didn't have time, they studied at least 20 right. years manuscripts. No one is studying one year. But you do point out the, the internal plurality and diversity is now a positive thing. It is fine. Right. It is for sure. Fine. You're happy with that. Do you see that same trend in other fields of mysticism or is that something that's you happening specifically in Jewish mysticism? I, by now, don't follow, follow too much what happens outside. Right. I'm still reading the same people, McGinn and Dupre and that I knew and uh, uh, only occasionally I, I read something going outside. For sure. You can see that people became much more, how to put it, practical, uh, dealing with neurology or this. With what? Neurology. Neurology, right. Okay. I mean, right. Uh, right. that they see something right. new. Right. It's interesting. Out of, out of really all of the scholars of Jewish mysticism that I've read, you engage most with theories of mysticism, with, with, um, with the methodologies of the study of mysticism. Yes. It's a, it's a fascinating field and subject of its own, which I think is, is undervalued. Yes, but uh, I am doing it uh, with the help of uh, experts and uh, not by myself alone. Right, right. Meaning I had a student who became a neurologist and, right. and we had discussions and uh, uh, I don't do it alone. You know, to I hear make that. it uh, I hear clear, that. I hear I don't that. claim here a hat and you had. But that, that is an important part of research, is, is the theories that... that, that yes, that's, that's important. I believe that uh, the human structure is important to understand what happened right, within right. the structure. But not just the human structure, also the theoretical constructs. I don't know how much theory I made. I mean, I contributed more to the hermeneutics uh, than to the theory of mysticism. Right. But you've analyzed theory of mysticism. I analyze from time to time right. the theories of Scholem right. or the Corbin and uh, yes, you're right, but uh, I don't see it, you know, as the most important issue. I hear that. I hear that. It's much more occasional being. I hear. How, how close is, is Jewish mysticism to other mystical traditions? Look. The first time of mysticism that I encountered studying was Hinduism. And uh, I admire very much the matter of power. Yoga is not only mystical. Yoga is a matter of power. And also the vision, Hindu vision of the sacrifice. It's theurgical. And uh, that had an influence on me, I assume. Christian mysticism, which I encounter much later, despite the fact I have seen Christian mystics as a child, I didn't know what I see. I was born not far away from the most important monastery, mystical monastery in Romania, mm. maybe in Eastern Europe. And I've seen the monks, but I had no idea what I see. Like, I didn't know what happened there. Only very late, late, I discovered in an encyclopedia that the monastery I've seen there, it was the center of 
a mystical movement. But I was not influenced by it. Uh, I assumed that the Hinduism was much, the, how to put it, the earliest and maybe the most important hmm. influence. On your own thinking? Yes. And, and Sufism? Sufism is for sure very interesting and my claim is that the influence of Sufism I claim it uh, from time to time. And I believe that historically true. But it's not far away from Christian mysticism. Right, right. Have you, and has, has, Buddhist, has Buddhist mysticism been a point of interest for you? Yeah. Buddhism. I read Buddhism in Israel, for sure. Yes, it's very attractive from many points of view. Uh, skeptical, critical, but uh, that's uh, not my approach toward mysticism. That's maybe my more personal approach. Hmm. Interesting. Do you see any, any metaphysical commonality between the, the, between the Buddhist and the Hasidic thinkers? And not so much. I know that uh, Buber was very fond of it. Uh, like many great ideas of Buber, it doesn't work in my opinion. This is, there are moments of interesting remark by Buber. And he is claiming that uh, who is at the door? It's I. I, I is, you know, well, he made interesting remarks, but that's, in my opinion, marginal. Is what? Marginal. Marginal, I hear. I Means they are yeah. interesting. That's very interesting. Cone. Right. But, okay. Yeah. What is the structure? I believe that uh, the Besh knew also the Hindu, what's called the parable of the wall. Yeah. With the illusion. Yeah. That's Maya, right. in my opinion. Right. So, not that I. Those are moments. What about the Buddhist belief? You know, the Buddhist belief that um, nirvana is the, is the realization that there is no difference between samsara and nirvana, right? Yes, I don't like this uh, modern, how to put it, no, how you call Buddhist it? Buddhist modernism? Yes, it's uh, non-duality. Right. That's, again, a claim that I see in some younger scholars. Speaking about well, you don't you don't think you don't think someone like Nagarjuna was a non-dualist? Look, <laughs> you know it's very nice to say it. Non-dual. Unfortunately, I see too many dualities. <laughs> in their in in their it own is, thinking. You know, that's a trend. Right. A trend. You know, in '81, I was for for the first time in California. So people took me to Malibu, which was actually an island of Buddhists. Some years later, people took me to Pico, was the center of Kabbalah. So you can see the change in the fashion. In fashion. Uh, fashion, fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, at the beginning they took me here, there. Do you, um, Who is going now to Malibu? Do you do you think that there is non-duality uh, in Judaism? Do you see do you see non-dualism? I no, don't understand exactly what non-duality. <laughs> so I cannot. Uh, I know the people are writing a lot right. about it, but uh, I must admit that I don't understand. My this is my last question. The last question is. The, the Kabbalists seem to have two gods, right? And this is something that, that Shalom's written on and you've written on. There's God as Ein Sof, uh, and then there's God as Firat, and there's God as the Yotzeh Barishit, yes. the, the God of, of the Bible and of, of yes. tradition, religion. Um, Shalom wrote some interesting works trying to explain the different techniques of different Kabbalists that are trying to negotiate. No, that. that's too complicated question. Complicated yeah, question. Too complicated. <laughs> I don't believe that, uh, you know, the division between God, of the Bible, the, the insof, and that, that's simplistic, uh, too simplistic. 
Well, Hasidists, you have in Sof, and you have uh, Rabbi Nachman is saying do. Right. So what, he was not a good Hasid. Well, it's a, it's a personalization of the, of the Ensof, no? Why not say there are two different issues? What are the two different issues? One is more personal and the one which is apersonal. Right. But not non-duality or something like that. There are different ideas coming from different places which are combined in one way or another. That's all. Right. Um, Professor Udell, I want to thank you very much for, for giving generously okay. of your time and presence and knowledge. Uh, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, Yes, that remind me some moments in my life, yes. Um, was there anything in, was there anything that you felt that uh, that we missed or we we could have uh, mentioned no, that you wanted I, to mention? I don't miss me. <laughs> I don't want to transcend the interview. You don't want to transcend. It's it's interesting in your in your completeness, right? Yeah. Maybe that maybe in itself there's something mystical there that you don't you don't like anything. You're not looking for transcendence. There's a very that itself is is maybe a mystical direction. Well, if you like to call it mysticism, you can call it mysticism. You know. <laughs> It's up to you. I don't feel complete at all. I, mean, I feel that I don't know in my, enough and, uh, about things I write and that sign of completeness, yes. Mm. So you, you feel lack? Curiosity is part of it. It's curiosity when you feel that you don't know. Right, right. So I still feel it. I think that's a beautiful thing that you're still curious all these years later. I enjoy, I tell you. The most important thing in my scholarship is that I enjoy, enjoy it. it. Tell, me, tell me one last thing and, and, and we'll end with this. What do you find beautiful in Kabbalah? Well, I'm not very aesthetically influenced, uh, biased. From time to time, the language is uh, not exactly the best Hebrew, not to speak about Hasidism but also others, and the structure, you know, structure, and everything is parshanut, running from one place to another, and I don't look those elements to those elements. Meaning that you don't have, you know, majestic edifices, which can be short, but well-organized and logical, and you don't find it. You almost don't, don't find Kabbalistic poems. Meaning what you have is maybe, maybe five poems. Look to what happened in Islam. Right. All, all together. The Hadadi was Luria and was Edith Nefesh and how many do you have? Right. Right. What about something, if it's not, not, not linguistic beauty, but conceptual beauty? How? What about something that's conceptually beautiful? I don't know if it's beautiful. I mean, the concepts are changing. It depends where. And I mean, it's not, the concept doesn't remain static. Is that part of its secret? Maybe. It's not a secret. It's a fact. <laughs> I mean, is, it, is it part of the secret of its survival, I'm, I'm saying? Yes, it may be. Fixed things are easily broken. Okay, I must go home. Okay. Thank you for your time today. Yes. I very much appreciated it. Okay, thank you.